So uh, our third speaker is um, Andy, Andy Moore. Um, Andy was born and raised in Wellington, New Zealand, drawn to libertarianism, reading about the 1980s liberal reforms of former finance minister Roger Douglas, and also encountering the perils of bureaucracy during their teen years. Having ranted endlessly about the shortcomings of government, they channeled their libertarian angst into starting New Zealand's first Students for Liberty Club. Andy currently lives in Melbourne and is about to commence their second year of a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and International Studies and Social Theory at the University of Melbourne. Andy identifies as a left libertarian and is thoroughly interested in anarchism, feminism, queer theory, agorism and free markets with the aim of a freer society based on reciprocity, free exchange and self-determination. They're also the vice chairperson uh, of Australia and New Zealand Students for Liberty. I'd also say you've never seen anybody tear down a Marxism conference poster, poster much like Andy. I've seen it personally. It's fearsome and wonderful. Um, they'll be speaking on queering libertarianism. Please welcome them to the stage. Let's try and get it up. Is that the one there? Oh, yeah, it came to it. Cool. Looks like it works and everything? Apparently so. Apparently so. Cool. There we go. <laughs> hi everyone. Yeah, nice RuPaul there. RuPaul there. Um, yeah, I, hi, I'm Andy. Um, thank you so much. I mean, Tim would be here, but um, I'd like to thank Tim for when he sees the video for inviting me here. It's my first time at Friedman speaking at the actual conference, so it's a massive honour and it's great to be a side to, like, to such experienced speakers. Um, I, yeah, I'm the only, I am the fucking leftist on the panel. Um, I, I'd, I would, I'd say I'm a leftist myself, um, just kind of like for tactical reasons. I, I like to say I'm a leftist because it lures people in who would not consider libertarianism otherwise. Um, today I'm going to talk about queering libertarianism. Um, and I'm probably, it's probably going to be like, I reckon probably one of the most SJW talks you will ever hear at Friedman. Um, I'm going to talk about identity, um, about how government policies, regulations, shape, mould queer identity and how it changes what it means to be queer um, in like a current state of society. Um, so kind of the first question would be, what is, what is queering? So queering is kind of like a term which is chucked around in um, kind of literary theory, social theory circles. Um, the term queer, first off, is often used kind of ref to refer to LGBTQ people, but it can be more than that. So the whole idea about being queer is being non-normative. It's about taking what is seen as normal in society, what is kind of enforced in society, and subverting it. Um, so challenging stereotypes. And it's usually done traditionally by gender, sexuality, and sex. Um, so examples of being having a queer gen you can have a queer gender, you could have a queer sexuality, in terms of you could be into kinks, um, you could be transgender, you could be genderqueer, you could be intersex, you could be homosexual, bisexual. Those broadly fall under, as, fall under the idea of being queer, um, because you are subverting current norms of sexuality, gender, and sex. Um, so yeah, the focus is on inversion and challenging the idea of norm normality. Um, however, the kind of idea of being queer and subverting what is meant, what is meant to be normal also kind of entails its own politics. Um, it's about kind of challenging um, structures which enforce, the, like, enforce concepts of normality um, and like kind of pressure people into certain ways of being and, and certain ways of um, acting in society, um, which I'll kind of explain about today. Um, then there's oh, libertarianism. Uh, libertarianism is belief in individual liberty. I mean, we all know that we'll roughly be libertarians, libertarian sympathetic. Um, it's the idea that we don't have to be, we should not be forced. Force should not be our first um, resort of action. Um, we should be left to, we should left to trade, be, be left to trade. We should be left to interact as free individuals. Um, and we should live together peacefully and cohesively. Um, sorry, I'm trying to ram this in. I thought this was gonna be long, I had more time than this. Um, the idea then, the idea I'm trying to create out of this is to mix queering and libertarianism, try to queer libertarianism. Um, so if we use queering as a lens, we treat it as a lens, we treat libertarianism as the ideology, we can turn this into a larger analysis. Um, so to have a queering view on society is to see how institutions have played a part in the suppression or enforcement of identities on people. Um, so if we're having queer, queering libertarianism, we look at what the government does. We look at how the government has, um, has kind of pressured people into adopting straight identities or cisgender identities. By the way, cisgender means um, if you have the sex, what your sex assigned at birth is lines up with your gender. So just clarification. Um, and we want to look how the government regulates, marginalises and erases queer people. Um, and I'll go through some examples of that today. Um, my, main, my main aim today is to go over ways governments today um, impact queer, 
queer people's lives in ways we don't consider. Because we know we talk about queer issues, we always hear the classic ones of gay marriage, we hear anti-discrimination law, but there are lots of subtle ways that regulations impact on our lives um, or our abilities to um, adopt subcultures. Um, or often there are policies which affect queer people we never consider or never, never hear about. So that's kind of what I want to, what I want to go over today. Um, so yeah, there's no question the state oppressed and controlled queers in the past, but what about today? So we've, we've, we've kind of heard about many of the examples of the past where we had um, gay conversion therapy, we had chapl chaplains in schools, um, we had colonialist practices um, where indigenous sexualities were, um, their, their expressions or indigenous genders, like their genders were banned from expressions in schools and churches. Um, but yeah, the question is, what about today? Um, so I'm going to kind of break it up into regulation, regulation um, marginalisation and erasure. So the first question is regulation. So marriage. Marriage is obviously regulated. Um, and the idea of marriage in our current society is marriage is a pinnacle of life. So it's one of the stages of life, a, ri a rite of passage. Um, so marriage in our current society is considered incredibly important. It's considered a, a pinnacle. Um, but the government monopolisation of um, marriage means it gets to control it. So the idea, first off, and I'm kind of going to work through this quite discursively, is that the government gets to control a pinnacle of society, it gets to control marriage. Um, and by regulating it and by excluding it, it manages to take a pinnacle of society and, and strain it towards one area of the population. What it manages to do is to say, marriage is a pinnacle of society, but we get to exclude queer people from it. So what it does is it takes what is an important, meaningful part of society and it puts in exclusion at the very heart of it. Um, so by excluding queer people from an institution by force and by regulation, what it does is it starts to create meaningful spaces for queer people to be excluded from life or to be de delegitimized. It stops queer read of it, definition of marriage, so it stops us from redefining institutions for ourselves um, or finding our own meaning, what meaningful way to go about our lives. And it stops us from doing what they want. Well, that text up down the bottom should not be there. That was just draft texting. <laughs> um, but yeah, the main idea is that um, we have to go to the government to get um, permission to be married. Um, we have to, you know, get their blessing. Um, and, and this is a real issue. We don't want to go to the government for permission to live our lives or attack, to act as we want. Um, and the issue is as well is when we get into the debate about marriage, um, the question ends up being, should we be equal? Um, or should we, should we be equal in the marriage um, licensing institution? Or should marriage be traditional? When the real question is, why should the government be there? A lot of queer people don't want the government intervening in their lives, and they don't want governments telling them how they can and cannot define their relationships. And it gets even more problematic. Um, I hate to bring that, that up as an example, because he was a speaker here. Um, but there was a big controversy about a debate which was hosted with, by, um, I forgot what it was hosted by, um, Coopers? It was Coopers, yeah. Coopers held a debate on marriage equality. Um, and I think it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a, a bit of a mad fuss. It shouldn't have been a massive fuss. But there was one thing which stuck out about it. So the two people I picked were both Liberal MPs. It was Tim Wilson, I forgot the other guy. Um, he's more conservative. Hasty, hasty, hasty yeah. Um, and Tim Wilson's argument that he made, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go fast. So I'm gonna go fast. I'll go through that quickly. So Tim Wilson's argument in the end for gay marriage was that family, family is an important part of society and queer people should be included in it. The idea is that um, queer people shouldn't be living their lives as they want or redefine marriage, they should adopt the definition of marriage already held by society. So the idea is we should assimilate queer people into this already um, family-centric society rather than allow them to live their lives as they please or take on their own definitions. Cool, I'm gonna go quick now. So licensing gender. Um, I'm a genderqueer person myself. I don't identify as a guy or a girl. However, I have a M on my M marks on my birth, my birth certificate, and I have an M on my passport. I don't have $600 up my sleeve. I'm from New Zealand. Um, <laughs> if I, <laughs> yeah, it makes it even better. Um, so if I want to go change my name, I've got to spend $600 on getting my uh, my birth certificate changed, my passport changed, um, and if I'm under 18, I have to get parental permission. And not everyone gets parental permission. Not everyone can go and get their birth their um their their documentation changed. It often involves going through court. So the government basically tells you how you can legally call your, how you can refer to yourself in legal institutions. When you go to the bank, the government tells you what you can call yourself. You can't say, I prefer to be called Andy. Yeah, they tell you, no, you have, to, you have to use this name which we've ascribed to you at birth. And they say, tough luck. If you want, if you want to do otherwise, we're going to charge you. So it puts a price on you actually expressing your identity as you wish. Hormones. Um, it was interesting, Alvin, you brought up um, contraception before. Hormones gets even worse. Um, so in Australia, we, um, to get onto hormones, I was looking it up before. So I haven't gone onto hormones, and I haven't 
managed to go through the process. Um, but to get hormones as a trans person to start transitioning, you have to get a GP appointment, you have to get a psycho psychological, psycho psychologist session, and at least two psychiatrist sessions to get hormones. If you're under 18, you cannot get hormones. But there is one option. You can go through family court. You can make an application to the family court, so you go through a legal process, and provided you've got all of the recommendations, you can get an application through to them. Here's the catch. In Victoria, 14 out of 200 applications for hormones for under 18s, picked about 16, were accepted. So even though they went through all the bureaucracy, they still got rejected. And there are stories of queer people submitting and resubmitting and resubmitting their applications for hormones and getting rejected. And having to go through that painful process every time to have the government tell you, you can't do that. And it's really shit, it really is. Um, there's also normalizing surgeries, and I won't have so much time to go into it, so I'll skip over a bit quickly. But the idea is that when intersex people are born, so people with non-discriminate genitalia, non-discriminate male or female, um, there is surgery which can be, um, which can be used on them, and the idea of consent is a bit dodgy because it's a child. Um, but the surgery, surg what the surgery does is it, it modifies the genitals, and it's often something which becomes traumatic for children later on. Um, and it's often described as a, process, as a process of genital mutilation by intersex groups because it creates trauma, depression, um, pains later on in their lives, and basically a whole lot of really terrible shit. Self-defense, I'll go this really quickly. Um, queer people can't defend themselves. In Australia, we have incredibly, incredibly um, tough rules on guns. The idea is you cannot hold a weapon or a dangerous object um, unless you have a legitimate reason. And that legitimate reason can only be self-defense. Cannot be, sorry, cannot be self-defense. And this is the key idea. Self-defense is not legitimate. Queer people are more likely to be attacked um, violently than straight people. So self-defense is illegitimate. Why is self-defense illegitimate? Because you're the police who protect you. Queer people are more likely to be attacked. So you tell queer people that you don't have to defend yourself so the government can do it for you. Queer people are also more likely to distrust the police because there's been, there's been a lot of surveys showing that it's often shown as, that the police are dominated by working class people who are not so, um, who are more hostile to alternative sexualities. So queer people don't feel more comfortable with them, but are paternalised and told they've got to suck it up. They can't use, they can't use anything to defend themselves. So marginalisation. Prisons, strip searches. Um, when you're, if you're a prisoner, you get patted down, you get patted down quite a lot and you get touched. You get felt up and you basically um, get searched all the time for drugs or whatever you're possessing. And for trans people, this is very invasive. Um, especially if, you're, if you have gender dysphoria and you're very uncomfortable with parts of your body. Gender sorting. People are sorted based on their sex at birth. If you're, if you're a trans woman and you identify as a woman, but you are assigned <coughs> male at birth, you get put in a male prison. Let me put it this way. So we've got five people, we've got five people here. Imagine we're all trans. Two of us will be raped. So 40% of trans people are raped in prison, 40%. So you're gonna, you basically have to expect there's likelihood you'll be raped if you're trans. And if you, if you consider prisons, a lot of the representation of prisons are victimless crimes, and that's also an effect of the drug war, and I'll talk about that soon. Um, and yeah, the, so the prison, rapes, prison rape, rape rates are high, and if the, government, if the corrections decide to protect queer people for their own safety, trans people, they put them in solitary, they put them alone. Is that time? Time, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll skip through it quickly. Refugees is another example. There are high amounts of refugee rape within prison, um, within detention centres, um, with from other refugees who have conservative views, um, or from um, other people on the islands. Um, otherwise, if they don't arrive on boat and they get sent back home, or they don't leave them boat, they get put in Indonesia, where there are lots of home, where there's lots of homophobia. Erasure, the drug war. So there's chem sex, which is a practice often used by queer people, by, by some queer people, where people take crystal methamphetamine, um, GHB or methadrone, um, and combine it with hardcore sex, an alternative sexuality and alternative drug. Because drugs are illegal, because drugs are stigmatised as a result, people cannot access help um, with harm reduction um, or with um, physical or mental health problems related to their drug use. What's more, because it is stigmatised to have, frankly, hardcore gay sex, you cannot use double stigmatization and you cannot talk about your problems. With the club scene, um, drug, the drug war has been used to justify raids on nightclubs um, and basically has shut down a lot of queer space in the past. And it's because a lot of queer people like to take drugs. It's part of the um, process of experimentation and sexuality. It's just a fact of how our community is and that's how we live. We should respect that. And yeah, it puts limits on experience. You ban people from taking drugs psych and being psychedelic. You stop people from experiencing themselves in a radical way. And that's what being queer is often about, about being yourself and experiencing your individuality. Schooling. Gender sorting is all the way throughout schooling. 
yeah, we normalize the nuclear family and we don't actually talk about queer people existing. Last thing in nanny statism, um, alcohol, to, alcohol and tobacco taxes, they make hedonism expensive. If you want to be, if you want to be sinful, if you want to be generate and you want to put things in your body, which the government does not like, they charge you more. Um, and you have lockout laws. So what's my point? Ask the Dordalano. Um, my point, the government institutionally, institutionally paternalised and can't keep up with queer people. Queer people are too radically individualist in many, in many ways and too challenging for the government to keep up with them. And the issue is when the government, when the government has risky um, actions being taken within the society, um, they can't deal with them, they have to regulate them out of existence. And that, means, that puts queer people at a disadvantage. Um, the collectivist bureaucratic nature of government prevents us from, creating, from catering to individual queer needs. We know what, the, we, what we want and the government often does not know what, they, what we want and they can't cater for us. Um, the way that governments determine legitimacy, um, in terms of self-defense, for example, constitutes society's view on queer, views on queer people. Um, so discourse produces reality. Um, the nature of queer lifestyles are odds with the ideas of government, um, and the government makes living queer, more costly, and more dangerous. And the government accepts rape within our institutions and says it's inevitable. Um, my time is up. I'm off. <laughs> Peace.